Jesus said there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed and who lived each day in luxury. At his door lay a diseased beggar named Lazarus. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally the beggar died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried, and his soul went to the place of the dead. There in torment he saw Lazarus in the far distance with Abraham. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. Anyone who wanted to cross over to you from here is stopped at its edge, and no one there can cross over to us. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them about this place of torment, so they won't have to come here when they die. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read their writings any time they want to. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will turn from their sins. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. We ask all our visitors at this time to please pass your cards to the end of the aisles, our ushers to take them up. We'll have a record of your visit and thrilled to have you. And we do have a gift for all our visitors on the stage. We want you to get a copy at the close of the lesson. Brother Dozer has shared with us a marvelous passage and a very significant one. You know, the Bible really says very little about heaven and very little about hell. The Bible takes up nearly all of its time telling us how to get to heaven and how to shun hell. But in this passage, Buck is read, we have the exception. The Lord draws back the curtain into the vast beyond and gives us a glimpse of what it's going to be like. I'm glad to acknowledge uh, my debt on my lesson today to Brother Burton Kaufman's commentary on the book of Luke. I've been very pleased with this set of commentaries. It's true to the Bible, and that's the most important thing. It's scholarly, yet, scholarly and yet it isn't tedious. It reads well. Sometime on Wednesday night, uh, the elders and I have been talking about me teaching a class on Wednesday night of adults, especially for those of you not now coming on Wednesday evening. And if so, it'll be in the 500-seat chapel, and we're going to study the book of Luke, and I want to use this commentary. We have the largest crowds on Wednesday night in all the world, among any local church of any kind. But if we had three or 400 more adults with the children, we'd just have to have chairs in the aisles about, and that'd be wonderful. This passage is, I believe, a parable. There's some dispute among Bible scholars. It's different from many of the other parables because uh, Jesus mentions the name of Abraham and he mentions the name of Lazarus and this certain rich man. But if you take the whole book of Luke and put it in context, uh, I think we'd have to agree it is a parable. It's true, but it's a parable. God the Father will be in paradise and will rule over that, not Abraham. But the lessons of this is, is so up-to-date and so needed and I think wonderful for us to consider. I want to call your attention to the characteristics of this rich man prior to his death. The Bible says he was clothed in purple and fine linen. That purple dye from Tyra they'd invented long ago was very expensive. And the kings and the very rich wore the garments that had been dyed with that purple. This man uh, had honor. And as far as we know, he had accumulated his riches honorably. There isn't anything suggested in the story that the man had cheated or lied or done anything wrong in the accumulation of wealth. But the rich man didn't use his riches properly. He was selfish and used them to satisfy his own lust. You know, a negative kind of goodness 
It won't take us anywhere but to hell. For the Bible says, To him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. In contrast to the rich man, Lazarus prior to his death, the Lord tells us, was just a poor beggar. He was without friends. He was in pain. He had sores. No medicine, no doctors, just the dogs to come and lick his sores. And then Jesus contrasts the two men after death. At the death of both, the destinies were sealed. At death, their relationship with God wasn't changed. Before he died, the rich man knew not God. And after he died, he knew not God. Lazarus knew the Lord before he died, and he knew him after he died. You know, the Old Testament false prophet said, Lord, let me die the death of the righteous. Everybody wants to die the death of the righteous. But he wasn't willing to live the life of the righteous, so he couldn't die that kind of death. At death, Lazarus had no expensive burial. We're not even sure he had any burial. The rich man had an ornate funeral. Uh, the well-to-do and the high and the mighty can always have a fine, pompous funeral. I'm not casting any expression on a funeral service. The funeral service is for the living. It's therapy. When anybody I love dies, I want a decent Christian burial. It's very important to me for my own welfare and for my own conscience and my own soul to see that those I love are, are honored. But a fine funeral won't have anything to do with our state after death or with God our Father. At death, each man, both the rich man and Lazarus, were rational and conscious. At death, the Bible says that angels carried Lazarus' spirit to Abraham's bosom. The poverty and affliction of the man was no evidence of God's disapprobation of it. We've got to bear that in mind. It's hard for those of us who are Christians to understand how some people so immoral can prosper so. We see the mafia, we see the gamblers, we see the gangsters. They are rich, they are powerful. And sometimes if we're not careful, we say, well, I know God must be with that man. Or look, look what he has. That, that's not true at all. A man can be rich because he had on the sweat and blood of innocent people. And I'm persuaded there's many a man in America with money today because he got there working people for nothing. I knew a rich man one time, had more than he could spend, and a pretty hard job to keep from uh, the government from getting much out of it. But everybody knew he had worked people for nothing all of his life. He'd gotten there on the sweat of honest men who labored for him and their families were almost in starvation. Must be a special place in hell for those kind of selfish people. At death, the rich man lifted up his eyes in Hades. He was honored in life. He was damned and condemned in death. At death, the respective states into which these two men passed were not their final abodes. Man doesn't go directly to hell when he dies. He doesn't go directly to heaven. If he's a righteous man, he goes to paradise, a place of peace and happiness to await the judgment. If he's wicked, he goes to Tartarus or Hades, a place of unrest. The judgment doesn't determine man's destiny. It's but a measuring and a receiving of the reward. And then Jesus gives us the story of these men after death. After death, they could both remember. Abraham said to the rich man, Remember, you had your good things back on earth. And the Bible says that Lazarus was comforted. After death, the rich man was in torment, in such great pain that he cried for a drop of water to cool his tongue. The rich man wanted uh, God to hear him, but when he was alive, he didn't want to hear God. And when a man will not hear God when he lives, neither shall God hear him when he dies. Then after death, the rich man's prayer was unanswered. It was unanswered 
He was selfish in life. He failed to repent. And the tragic mistake of the rich man was not having money. Money is all right if it's used as a servant and not as a master. The tragedy of his life was he never repented. He never knew God. There are eight false doctrines taught in the world, door to door, and radio and television, that this story repudiates. You know, if our boys and girls know the Bible, and they hear things that's contrary to the Word of God, they'd recognize that false doctrine. Let me share these eight false doctrines and then draw a few lessons on the positive side from this great passage, and then the lesson is yours. The doctrine of modernism is refuted in this story. The modernists say that the Bible's just another book, and the Old Testament is not true. But you know, you cannot believe the New Testament without believing the Old Testament. For the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed and the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. Jesus put his approval and endorsed Moses and what the Old Testament says about it. Jesus also endorsed the story of the flood in Matthew 24. He endorses the story of the creation in the Bible. I talked to a sailor one time, very intelligent young man, about 25. He said, Brother Noah, I have a wife and children. I want my children to be reared right. I don't want them to be atheists. I want them to have high standards, to be moral, to have hope. But said, I want to ask you this. Could I believe that New Testament without believing the old? And I said, no, you cannot. You mean tell me I can't be baptized into Christ? I said, no. You wouldn't be baptized. You'd just be ducked in water. You mean I can't believe the New Testament and disbelieve the Old? That's exactly what I mean. He said, well, that puts me in a bad spot that I can't swallow that story about that fish swallowing that man. I said, well, you're a United States Navy man. You've been around the world. He said, yes. I said, let me ask you this. Do you believe Uncle Sam could make a fish to swallow 30 men and keep them down 30 days? He said, well, I sure do. I said, in the name of high heaven, if Uncle Sam can make a fish to swallow 30 men for 30 days, don't you think the God of heaven could make one to swallow one man three days? He said, I'll declare. I said, I never thought about that. I said, you think about it. The next day I baptized that man and all of his life. He's been faithful to the church as far as I know and he's reared his family in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. The doctrine of Christian science, which is neither Christian nor science, is repudiated by this passage. They claim to believe in Christ, yet they deny sin, deny sores, deny death, and deny future punishment. But in this teaching of Jesus, you have it all. You have sin, you have sores, you have death, you have pain, you have future punishment. And any doctrine that denies it has to be the doctrine and commandments of man. The doctrine of spiritualism is refuted in this passage we're studying today. The spirit, spiritualist claims, you know, that the dead can get word back to their loved ones on earth. How many people have been hoodwinked uh, out of how many dollars on that doctrine of witchcraft the last 2,000 years? Reminds me of the fortune teller that had this widow. She won't know if her husband got to heaven. And said, well, said, give me $25 and I'll look in the crystal ball and see. And she looked and got him within 10 miles of pearly gates. Had to have another 10. Finally, just got right on up to within five feet of heaven and said, another $25, I believe the crystal ball will tell me. The widow snapped her pocketbook too. Said, no, sir, he said, John always was a good jumper. And if he can't jump five feet, he can go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but... <clears throat> Those in hell are ministered unto by saints in heaven, the spiritualist says. But this story tells right the opposite and teaches the opposite. Jesus affirmed that the rich man could get no word back to his brothers. He was praying, send Lazarus with a message. The rich man could not get back. And the rich man could not be ministered unto by Lazarus. The cults, the spiritualist, the witchcraft of today is just exactly that, witchcraft. The doctrine of our Adventist and Jehovah's Witness friends who teach soul sleeping is re 
is reputed by this passage and refuted. The rich man was conscious after death. He could remember the good things he had enjoyed. He was conscious of torment. He could remember that the water was cooling and he cried for a drop to cool his tongue. He could remember his five brothers. Lazarus was comforted. It is the body that sleeps in death, not the soul. The body sleeps and the body goes back to dust, but the soul goes back to God who gave it. The doctrine that the wicked can be free from torment by the prayers for the dead is refuted in this story. Jesus says, there is a great gulf fixed between the rich man and Lazarus, and there is no crossing from thence to hence or hence to then. Not accidental, but a great gulf fixed. Praying for the dead, my dearly beloved, is wishful thinking. There's not an example of it in the Bible. There's not an inference of it in the Bible. It's the doctrine and commandments of men. We wish, just like we wish, if we could turn back the clock. Turn back, turn back, O oh time in thy flight, and make me a child just for tonight. But it's wishful thinking. It can't be done. The doctrine of Calvinism, that people are converted by a direct operation of the Holy Spirit, is refuted. Jesus taught that repentance was brought about through the power and conviction of the Word of God. Receive with meekness the engrafted Word which is able to save your soul. The doctrine of a second chance is refuted in this passage we're studying today. The rich man was offering no comforting promise. And people who tell you Jesus is coming back to earth to establish a kingdom and you'll get another chance, that's the theories and doctrines of men. The judgment will be according to the deeds done in the body, whether they be good or whether they be bad, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10. And it is appointed unto man once to die, and then the judgment. Last of all, the doctrine that the dead have lost their identity is repudiated by this passage. The rich man had not lost his identity. Lazarus had not lost his identity. And Abraham had not lost his identity. But now, let's close on a positive note. I want to be positive. I believe if this pulpit turned negative, it wouldn't be three months until we could move into 500-seat chapel. I believe within a year we could go back to that little rock chapel. We'd have no space problems, and we'd have no parking problems, and we'd have no growing problems of providing more. Just give us a good negative pulpit in any church for a little while, and there won't be any more uh, worry about growing. So I want to close on a positive note. It seems to me that this great story should cause us at least to remember these things. Let us remember that the souls of men do not die with their bodies. Let us remember that the soul is conscious after death. Let us remember that the righteous go to a place of peace and happiness and the wicked go to a place of misery. Let us remember we should never envy the rich. And I want to just talk about that a minute. Don't envy the rich. The rich have problems. Forever how rich you are, there are those who are richer. I was offered a half interest in a piece of property worth a few hundred thousand dollars one time if I would give my life to the business. And I, I admit I was tempted. And I said to my wife, I believe, I believe I could make a million dollars. She said, well, I wouldn't have you in that for anything. I said, you mean you don't want me to have a million dollars? She said, you read me right. I don't. Can't you get it through your thick head? I like to live like you are, poor. Says, people change when money comes. And you could change. And I wouldn't let you go in that under any circumstances. Not because I'm afraid you'd fail, but because I'm afraid you might succeed. And it'd take you away from God. I think that was a smart observation. Don't you pray for your children to be rich. You just pray that whatever they have, they'll be able to use to the glory of God and the good of mankind. We had a family in Madison got rich quick and got uppity. 
bought them a big place on Bell Mead, and they were the most miserable people that ever breathed because those people over there wouldn't accept them. We don't want any get rich quick coming in here. And they were miserable, miserable people. Don't envy the rich. Let us remember that we should not live in luxury while Lazarus begs at our gate. I thank God today and every Lord's Day we give a great portion of what we have here at Madison for little homeless children and the poor and the old. We better, because it is not right to live in luxury while Lazarus begs at our gate. Let us remember that the selfish use of wealth brings torment after the grave. Let us remember if ordinary means of grace can't reach us, there's not going to be any extraordinary means. The Lord says if they won't hear Moses and the prophets paraphrasing it, if they won't read that Bible and they won't hear the word of God, there's no need to send anybody back from the dead. They won't hear them. And after this, Jesus raised Lazarus, maybe not this Lazarus, but the brother of Mary and Martha, and the Pharisees sought to kill him rather than to listen to him. And then let us remember that he who is lost in death is lost in eternity. And let us remember that God's word is sufficient to save us. Let's bow and pray. Oh God, we thank you that through your blessed son Jesus, you drew back the curtain in the long ago and gave us a glimpse into the life beyond the grave. Oh God, let us realize anew today that we are mortal, weak and frail and made of dust. And let us realize that the soul will last forever and that someday we'll stand before you in judgment. Let us realize that our destiny is sealed at death so while we have breath and life, we pray you will help us to love you and to believe in you and to strive to do your will. If there's one in this audience who's never confessed the blessed name of Jesus and been baptized, we pray they'll do it right now. While together we stand and sing in Jesus' name, amen.